ঠিক আছে আমি অনলাইন গেলাম এবার আমি দু মিনিটে ইন্ট্রোডাকশন দেবো তারপর তোমায় বলবো কিভাবে কথা বলবো ঠিক আছে ওকে ওকে ওয়েলকাম এভরিবডি অ্যান্ড সরি ফর দ্য ডিলে ফাইনালি উই আর ব্যাক টু অনলাইন সো আই হোপ অল অফ ইউ আর ডুইং ওয়েল ইন দিস ট্রেঞ্জ অ্যান্ড ডিফিকাল্ট টাইম নেভার দিলেস দিস ইজ আওয়ার থার্ড ফ্যাকাল্টি সেমিনার অ্যান্ড টুডে আই হ্যাভ দ্য প্লেজার টু ইন্ট্রোডিউস প্রফেসর অনির্বন সাই সো প্রফেসর অনির্বন সাই ডিড হিজ মাস্টার্স ফ্রম আইআইটি কানপুর ইন নাইনটিন এন্ড দেন moved to IIS Bangalore to do his PhD in 1999. Uh, after that, he did three uh, consecutive postdocs, one in uh, Simon Fraser, one is Waterloo, and then in McGill. And afterwards, he joined IIT Bombay in uh, 2004. Since then, he is with us, and today he is going to talk about, um, about how does polycrystal and solid flow. So before I give him the stage, let me also mention that uh, we are uh, going to take questions from the YouTube chat window. So please do write it there. And after the talk finishes, we will uh, ask you to join the, the room, the Jitsi room, where you can directly ask Professor Sai the questions that you need to ask. OK, with this uh, introduction, let me give the stage to Anupan Sai, and he will carry on from you. So Anupan Sai. Yeah, thank you, Chomo. Um, also for the opportunity to give this talk. I hope I'll be able to make some sense of what I say. Um, it's slightly strange that I don't see anybody. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so it's about polycrystals. Um, so, okay, so just uh, stop me and ask questions if there, are, if there are any. So why bother about polycrystals? Now, the title itself is somewhat, uh, confusing because on one hand it says solid and then it also talks about flow okay um, so what i'm going to cover um, is essentially work of two phd students um, shanti uh, who graduated in 2013 and uh, tanmay who graduated just last year and uh, in the uh, last uh, few years uh, since we had started doing MD simulations, we have collaborated with Pinaki, who is at IMSC Chennai. And um, very early on, I was initiated in this field, I should say, by Indra Somasdar, uh, who is a professor in material science and metallurgy department. We somehow got entangled in a uh, project with Tata Steel along with him and got to know. Uh, the, some problem and tried to model it and miserably failed. And then I realized that I should basically, I should go back to basics rather than trying to uh, understand difficult engineering problems first. Okay. So uh, I will essentially cover two words and then, uh, and I will uh, give you only some parts of it, which I think is interesting. So let me just start. Um, so why polycrystals? Now in nature, all the solids that you see, all the natural solids around us, they are never single crystal. It is in fact very, very difficult to form single crystals. In the labs, artificially, sometimes they manage to uh, grow crystals which are more than a couple of microns. So mostly all solids are made of uh, many small crystals which sometimes we call grains. Okay, so, uh, so I will just give you a small introduction to polycrystals and then I'll talk about if you um, apply force on polycrystals in different forms. For example, it could be shear or it could be pressure, gravity, etc. How do they flow? And uh, the fact that they flow itself is a slight surprise, but we'll see. Um, as we go along. OK. Uh, yeah. So here is a layman's yeah, view of a polycrystal. So you can see that. Uh, so I will be confining myself completely in two dimensions, easier to understand also. 
So what you see on the right panel, uh, this colorful diagram, you see these chunks. So they are grains. And within every grain, you have a triangular arrangement of lattice. So this is 2D. If you see this diagram on the left, if you concentrate um, on this, I mean, you can clearly see there are two zones and the alignment of the atoms is different given by those straight lines. That's one of the symmetry axis of the triangular lattice on either side. And uh, so in between somewhere here, there's a grain boundary. So these different orientations are given by different colors in this diagram. And you can see that um, they are more or less straight and there are sharp corners and so on. So this diagram was generated in our simulation, which I will come to in details. So that's a polycrystal. Um, and uh, given the structure, you can uh, guess that such an object will have properties which could be a mixture of crystals and amorphous material. So what is an amorphous material? Amorphous material is nothing but a um, granular material which does not have any underlying order unlike this polycrystal which at least has order within these grains and when you go from one grain to another at the boundary it changes i mean the direction of orientation changes but amorphous uh, material are something which don't have any uh, long range order so polycrystals have some order there is some length scale, I mean, which can be taken as the average grain size. Okay, so they are in between crystals, which has infinite order and versus amorphous material, which doesn't have any significant long range order. Okay. And there has been a lot of work on amorphous material because of its importance. And people have been struggling to understand the um, correlation length scale in amorphous materials like glass and so on. And uh, so, uh, on the other hand, polycrystals have been looked upon quite closely by mostly by engineers, not much by physicists. Engineers are particularly interested in polycrystals because all the uh, metals that they prepare for different utility, they want various properties to come out by the manufacturing process. For example, they want strength. The material has to be of certain strength it should be sometimes be ductile and so on, various properties, it's his heat conductivity and so on. So they are interested in uh, processing the material in such a way so that they can control these uh, grain sizes. I'll give you a direct example, how grain size could be important. Uh, sorry, I just, yeah, so here, I'm showing a um, plot from a actually a review paper. I don't remember the age, uh, I, mean, I mean, the year. It's basically a comment in, in nature. Um, so it was summarizing experimental data from some group. And you can see that on the y axis, there is strength. Uh, that is the material strength. And on the x axis, there is average grain size. And uh, earlier, People used to think that uh, if you make, I mean, for, from, for example, from this diagram, if you can make your metal in such a way so that your grain sizes are very small, which is this part of the curve, let's say, that you are going from large grain size towards small grain size, strength of the material actually goes up. So this was the case till 80s, 90s, when people had started making uh, material with very small grain sizes. And you can see the scale here about between 10 to 20 uh, nanometer. So if you go below that, uh, the behavior completely changed in the sense that smaller grain doesn't mean stronger material anymore. It means it so smaller grains weakens the material beyond certain size, which was pretty counterintuitive in the sense that it is not that people understood everything why if you make grain size smaller, why does the strain go up? There, was, there are always some, some uh, hand-waving theories which, and also experiments 
and people are still trying to understand this portion of the graph. But uh, this portion was quite it was quite counterintuitive, and it told us that um, to make the material strong, it's, it's not necessary to go to very small grain size. Okay, of course, different mechanisms work in this regime versus in that regime. Okay. Now, um, the so so um, so there was a big push from the material science community to understand what gives you grain size. How can you control them? How can you manipulate them? Okay. Uh, okay. But on the other hand, on the physics side, polycrystals had not has not been looked into closely. People were mostly concerned with either amorphous material or liquids or crystalline solids and so on. Okay, so mm, the next one, yeah. So uh, this is a physicist characterization of a polycrystal. So we know that um, for a crystal, for a single crystal, so I'm showing a picture of a polycrystal and you will barely, I think, make out that there are grain boundaries which are slightly light and there are bulk portions where there are grains. So such a polycrystal, um, what kind of uh, pair correlation function will it show? For example, um, if it was a solid which has infinite ordering scale, we know it will be black peaks. That is peaks of all, um, of course, that that those that black peaks occur in the Q space, the, the reciprocal space. Um, but if you go for the corresponding uh, pair correlation function, you will still get spikes, delta function spikes in the real space. And this x-axis is in units of lattice spacing. Okay. Now, for a polycrystal, um, what you get is what I drew here. So this is from uh, this is uh, this graph is obtained by analyzing this configuration, for example. Um, actually, they give something quite close to liquids. If you have seen how the pair correlation function looks for liquids, in liquids, there, there will be a first high peak, uh, and then there will be multiple peaks, but much weaker than this, and they will ripple down to some constant value. Okay. Uh, Whereas in polycrystals, what you are seeing constant, is that, the, the constant still means a finite correlation, right? Yes. No. So, so, so constant, so G of R1 would mean that uniform density. That is, uh, yes. so, okay. So G, what G of R tells you physically is that, suppose I have an atom at the origin, what is the probability that I will have another atom at, at distance R? Okay? Right. So for example, when it is, uh, when you th if you think of small distance, then if there is an atom at origin, and then there is high high likelihood there will be another atom within a spacing of typical interparticle distance. But as you go far and far, uh, the positions are getting randomized, so the probability of having another atom will slowly become will become uniform. Mm. Okay, so if this was a liquid, these first few peaks will be very small. There will be some peaks and it will go to constant. Here for polycrystals, something in between is happening. You have sharp enough peaks and then it, it goes to some constant. And this decorrelation is happening because of this finite grain size. Okay, so on the right, you see actually a experimental plot. Um, so this is just, I'm trying to say that the polycrystal I'm showing you in, from a simulation has generic uh, features which agree with the experiment as well. Okay, uh, now uh, moving on. Yeah, so now we are, what we are doing or what we are going to do, okay, let me show you that once more. So imagine you have a polycrystal like this between two plates. There is a plate on the top, there is another plate on the bottom. Imagine two dimension, and then you are applying some force on this polycrystal. So the force could be in different forms. For example, you could move the upper plate to the left and the lower plate to the right. So that will be a shear 
uh, flow and on the other hand you can also put a pressure on this end higher than the other end so then also this crystal this uh, these atoms in between they will be forced to flow so you can generate a flow in some way i am saying it flow although i have to really tell you more on that uh, because see if i okay so i think it will become clearer as we go on uh, Okay. Yeah. So first, let us uh, look at what happens in a fluid. So, so when I talk about flow, so there are certain generic flow patterns that happens in normal fluids. Okay. So you see this diagram. In in this, um, so there are there is a plate on the top and there is a plate on the bottom, and there is high pressure on the left, low pressure on the right. So the fluid is being forced. and it flows and the red curve gives you the parabolic profile which is very generic um so this is very not a very uh, uh, the there is a question the yeah. question is uh, that what are the different colors on this plot yeah i am showing i am coming to that so these these are let's take two types. questions together so there is one more sort of yeah. interrupt uh, and that question is uh, saying that the particles for the polycrystal would be different from a liquid is it true and the correlation function is between atoms in both cases is the, these are the two questions okay uh, okay the the second question i will answer first so in this diagram yeah so uh, in this so in general um, see polycrystals uh, you can have a atomic polycrystal uh, in which there is no there is only one type of atoms let's say okay and for for example let's say um, sodium crystal for example you don't have any other other atoms on the other hand you can have polycrystals of colloidal molecules in the sense that suppose colloidal particles put in water now these colloidal particles can form a crystal of their own so in that case this pair correlation function will be the about the position of the colloidal particles not the fluid particles okay so this is about the position of either atoms or units which are forming the crystal not the background fluid if there is any because in, in atomic systems you don't have any background fluid in case of colloidal crystals you have a fluid and in that you have thrown in some bigger particles the colloids which are forming the crystal okay and uh, coming to this first question colors and coming to that okay, so in this there are these different colors so these are different type of flows for example so uh, now this i took from somewhere um, and i will mostly consider concentrate on the red and the green um, okay so so uh, when you have a very slow flow very low reynolds number Reynolds number characterizes the how 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 fast is your flow. In that case, you will have this red curve. So this comes by solving Stokes equation. On the other hand, if you keep on increasing the velocity of the uh, flow by applying high pressure difference, and if you keep doing that at very high pressure difference, actually it becomes turbulent. That means you will not get this nice parabolic flow. but in between somewhere the flow is like this green curve so what you see is that for the most of the width of the channel it is almost uniform and at the i mean near the walls it has a very very high gradient now it has to have it has to be like that because there is no slip boundary condition that is the walls and the flow the walls are trying to stop the flow and at the boundary the atoms or the molecules which are moving they has to be at rest with the wall so that, that is called no slip okay so because of that you see that both the green and the red has zero velocity the x axis is the velocity at the walls at the two walls okay so in the green case 
it attains that constant velocity but via going through a very high gradient from zero to that value and in the parabolic case is it, it just varies gradually okay now this uh, one more question yeah yeah so there is one more question it's about uh, in the right hand panel what rho and sigma refer to it may be the previous plot or oh, just a second the last one yes yeah, so is there a sigma and rho this one yes yes here there is sigma and rho what are those oh okay so um, where do you see rho okay rho is the density okay so rho is the density um, and uh, actually sorry i think i said something like this also the right hand side diagram also came from a simulation so they are varying the density and sigma is the diameter of the molecule which makes the fluid so what it is showing is that actually they have shifted the zero they are trying to show that at higher density this peaks gets more um, they get just a second at high uh, a second yeah so the, the lower ones are at higher density and uh, i think no actually yeah i'm wrong it is no, rho is not the density i am not sure what this is this is uh, yeah sigma is certainly so rho is a actually a length scale i think i don't know what what rho is yeah I did not look into it carefully, but R is the same interparticle spacing, and sigma is the particle diameter. Okay, so there is they are varying some property of the of the fluid which they are working with. The polycrystal. Okay, in in our case, actually we always work with a very high density because without that there would be tendency of forming liquid because there will be voids and so on. So here there is another question in this plot. Uh, yeah. The question is that the velocity profile is in no slip condition in the walls. Is this correct? Yes. So that is the velocity in contact with the wall, the fluid in contact with the wall don't move. Sunita was saying that is the rho polydispersity? Is rho polydispersity? I don't know. Okay. I have to look up. I don't know. And then there is another question. Uh, let's yeah. finish this question and then we continue. So, is it possible to introduce a small non-zero velocity difference between the boundary and the fluid layer next to it? That is from uh, Uma. Uh, okay, so those are slip boundary conditions. But typically, in nature, what you find is that see, this no slip boundary condition occurs because of the roughness of the wall. Now, uh, typically, most of the cases, no slip is obeyed. By most fluids, I yeah I have heard about slip slip boundary condition also uh, finite slips, um, but uh, that has to be and there's something special has to be done for that. I don't know exactly, but this is the most natural boundary condition which most of the fluids obey with uh, typical rough walls. Okay. okay, let's continue. Yeah, so uh, now. Imagine instead of this fluid, you have the polycrystal inside. Okay, now uh, if it has to flow, it is quite clear that it cannot take the parabolic profile. It is possible that uh, because if it took a parabolic profile, you see that then the different layers, different horizontal layers, will be flowing at different speeds. So that will break up the grains. Okay, so you cannot have a polycrystal as well as having this kind of profile. Okay, so typically polycrystals, what they may do is the is case the green case. Uh, just ignore that writing GX static and all that. Um, what they may do is that um, the the bulk of it, most of it, it may flow like a chunk, like a uh, rigid solid. So that can preserve the crystal properties. I mean the polycrystalline property at the boundaries. Things will break up. Okay, so that is one possibility. And in fact, most polycrystals are found to move like that at certain velocities. Now, uh, the what Uma is saying may connect to this what they call here plug flow. See, if, although they are drawing the 
blue line all the way to the um, walls, but practically it doesn't happen. It may be possible that this thickness um, where the velocity goes from zero to some finite value is very, very thin compared to the diameter of this channel, but that has to happen. So, uh, and typically that type of flows are called plug flow. And this happens in chemical reactors where they mix things and push at a high speed. So you don't find this parabolic profile there. On the other hand, you find, you find this green or close to blue type of profile. Okay. So there is another question on Ivanda from Professor Singh. He's asking, does nearly flat flow front imply infinitely large viscosity preventing interlayer slip? Or in other words, very large interlayer binding? Otherwise, very large? Sorry. Interlayer binding. Uh, no, it does not. It does not um, imply large viscosity. What it implies is that the that um, see the the gradient the the gradient has to be there because of no slip, and the fluid has to move in move on because you are applying force. You are applying an external force, so plug doesn't happen because of high viscosity. It happens basically because of high velocity. And and this uh, um, so so um, you can see that in the case of plug at the boundary there will be very sharp gradients and when you have very sharp gra gradients your basic assumption for a parabolic flow breaks down. Parabolic flow relies on Stokes equation, okay, and it also throws out acceleration and all all these terms. And so, but if you have very high velocity. Then you cannot throw out the acceleration term. Then viscosity is there, acceleration is also there. And if you, in case of fluid, if you push it harder and harder, this green thing will become turbulent. So you won't have any profile. On an average, it will still show some kind of mean velocity, but this front won't be very nice. There will be lots of fluctuations, but still you can have this kind of, I mean, if you still look at the average velocity, it could be green. Okay, so at very high velocities, you do get this green type of profile. At low velocities, you get this parabolic profile. Okay, so I'm just trying to make a guess. If it was a polycrystal, how should it flow? If it flows at all? So I already gave you some clue towards that. Okay, now uh, actually I will come to um, our simulation of polycrystal. I will not go in. I will not say much about the method that we do. It is so we do both MD simulations as well as other type of simulations called phase field crystal. Now, so I'll just come to two aspects um, for polycrystals, which are driven not by a pressure head like this, but uh, it is driven in the following way. That is, it is sheared. That is, there are two plates. The upper plates is moving to the right. Lower plate is moving to the left. So because of, again, because of no slip boundary condition, the upper fluid has to be at rest with the upper plate and so is the lower fluid. So the velocity profile will look like this for the fluid. Now, uh, if you put a polycrystal, what will that do? That's the question. Okay. Now, one thing is that polycrystals are not fluid. Okay. Polycrystals form because there is strong interatomic interaction between them. Um, and and there are grains and so on, so uh, so it 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 ought to be somewhat different, because a liquid flow will need that the there will be relative velocity past each other. On the other hand, grains will require they move at least the grain has to move as a whole, so there is a problem. So the polycrystals cannot move like this. Okay, so how do they move? So uh, even in this, and one more thing I can show you here is that um, um, one second. Uh, that is, you can see that there will be a tendency. If it was a liquid, there will be a tendency of circulation, meaning the fluid on this part is moving to the right, fluid on the left. I mean, below this midline is moving to the left. Okay, so there is a chance of a vertical kind of motion. Okay, both here as well as there. Now you, can, you may imagine. Suppose uh, 
So I, I'm basically telling you what, what is coming. You have a grain here. Instead of a liquid, you have a grain here. So you can imagine the grain may rotate actually. Rigid rotation. It is possible. See, because in a rotation, what happens is, suppose I have a circle here. And if I rotate it at some speed, what may happen is that the on the circle, the outer ones has to move faster than the inner ones. Okay, But still, uh, there won't be any relative motion between the atoms. Okay, so it is possible that if you have grains here, they may rotate under such a drive. Okay, now let's see what really happens. So here comes the, okay, now, now um, I'll show you what really happens, but um, something on the way, um, how solids flow. So this is an example of a, uh, this is not a polycrystal. The question, yeah. so, he done. so he's asking, the liquid and polycrystal has similar G of R. So how does liquid achieve this flow? No, 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 no. Actually, liquid does not have the same G of R. In case of liquid, you will find fast, hardly two peaks or so, which means short range order. In fact, liquids also have some kind of short range orders that is up to two or three, up to two to three molecules. There will be, they will be at distance, typically uh, two interparticle spacing or three interparticle spacing, and then it will become uniform for a Polycrystal is much, I mean, it, the, the oscillation goes strong till quite a large distance. Probably the decay length is different. The decay length is different. Yes. Much longer. Hmm. Let's continue. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to show you the motion in a uh, polycrystal. But uh, something on the way, it will be useful to know. That is that, uh, so this is the amorphous solid let's say uh, let's say cement for example or uh, marbles an artificial example many marbles put together okay now in amorphous solid if you apply a shear that means again between two plates and the upper plate is moving to the left lower plate is moving to the right you find what i'm drawing here this is from a paper a theoretical paper these are the velocity vectors you don't see the arrows so at least short lines the length of the line is the velocity and there, there are arrows which you don't see. But what you can see by bare eyes is that there are some vertical motions. You can see there is some circulation type of vertical motion in various places. Also you see that here in this zone, uh, there are there is a quad, there is a quadrupole structure I and mean, there are four pole sort of structure here you, you can see. Um, basically quadruple structure and it's happening because if you look at the velocities here um, you closely you will find that um, from two sides of this quadruple things are coming in towards this point and on these two sides things are going out okay so you have these quadruple structures and you have these vortices this is for amorphous material and in the language of amorphous material, these are called hotspots. And one finds, and this is well known for quite a long time, that as the material moves, I mean, the particles move, hotspots develop here and there, and they have long range effects. Um, but uh, there is no theoretical explanation, actually, that why such things form, such hotspots. And once it forms, it is easy to understand it will lead to a vortex and so on. But why does this form here and there? Uh, it is not understood. Okay. Now we will see in our poly the polycrystal that we simulate. See polycrystals are not amorphous. There are grains. But even in the context of in case in the context of polycrystal, we will see such structures. And there we'll be able to understand why they form. So let's go ahead. Okay, so this is our polycrystal. It's a simulation using some method, phase field crystal model. So uh, these different colors are different grains. And if you see closely, on the right, there this, this is the angle, 0 to 60 degree. Um, because of rotational symmetry, 180 degree rotational symmetry, um, because it's a hexagonal lattice, you, you cannot have mismatch um, more than 60 degree. So these orientations are all can be characterized 
using this angle 0 to 60 degree and you will see between two color different color regions the orientation is different and uh, at the boundaries these are grain boundaries you see pink and red pairs particles with pink and red pairs so what are they so they are dislocations okay so by now you know what are grains so if you see this figure on the right so what is a dislocation now if you see any one particle you will see they have typically six neighbors if it is if it is inside a grain perfect order but it may happen that let's see somewhere here at the grain boundaries you find if you look at this particle this does not have six neighbors it has five neighbors and you will find there is some other particle in the neighborhood there has to be which has seven neighbors so this is a defect it's called the dislocation and in the context of 2d solids it is called a edge dislocation so these pairs are basically dislocations and they form at the grain boundaries they can form in the interior also okay so this is a closed pack system this is a closed pack system so very high density high density oh. very high density uh, so the, the, if the density was low so okay i should i didn't mention this that forming a polycrystal within a simulation is not a very easy job so that itself uh, was a new thing um, but by now it is it has become quite standard uh, so between two grains there are these defects which we call dislocations and depending on the mismatch of orientation between two grains if the mismatch is high for example between this and that one then there will be more defect the, there is another question yeah from Prabhu Singh is asking are these hot spots a kind of wheel pool? Can you repeat? Can, are these hot spots? A kind of wheel pool. Uh, okay, now uh, there, yeah, yes, you can say so, but this is a, this is a, there is no sink here because the particle cannot vanish or particle is not created. So from two direction it comes in, so it's called a saddle. From two direction it comes inward and other two direction goes out there cannot be any loss of particle or gain of particle so in that sense it is it is um, yeah so that's what it is so are these are topological in nature in the sense that one can associate some number like right hand what is left hand what is and uh, i don't know actually uh, because i mean yeah i don't know um, there could be you have to think about it okay but Okay, so uh, so we have grains and we have defects, and the defects preferentially sit at the grain boundaries, and so on. Um, and and there is a relation which tells you depending on the misorientation between two zones, what will be the defect density. More the misorientation, more is the defect density. Okay, so this is the simulation. What you will see here, so this is a very um, this is a very simplistic case. That is, you will see only two grains to start with one on the left one on the right and they have different orientation you can make out from here and these red portions they will go away when the simulation starts um, so we will we start the simulation with two grains and you and there will be grain boundary at the middle and there are dislocations you will see as the shearing starts that means i'm moving the plate on the top and the bottom in opposite directions these defects will keep on moving and eventually they will be they will vanish okay so let's just see the simulation okay one problem is that if i cannot go online uh, i won't be able to uh, so maybe there will be you cannot just play it otherwise means in, uh, outside the window outside the window okay let me see oh okay if i play outside the window that must be okay yeah just a second that be possible once again actually no i don't have it here sorry i don't take the risk of yeah, maybe okay. At, at the end, maybe I'll, I'll try. I have to search for. It's okay. Uh, it was in a cute video, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, let me just move on. 
yeah so in the in our context so when we put this here what happens is something like this so i am not showing you the the particles at the boundary they are white the reason is that they are very high speed so the arrow is associated with so there are arrows these are velocity vectors associated with every particle this is another question from yeah. uh, arobind vehra so he is asking how many phases are there in this phase field crystal oh this phase field crystal actually there are only two phase one is the bright and one one is the background one so actually yeah i won't go into the this phase field thing now just for the timing think of them, them as particles Okay. Let's take another question from yeah. Professor Singh. He is asking, is it not right that these locations refer to low density defects in in rather extended periodic system, long range order? Sorry, can you repeat this one more? Yes. Is it not right that these locations refer to low density defects in rather extended periodic system? Will low it be right to use this terminology in rather disordered system? Low density. Uh, I want to say low density. See, okay. See, it is not really. See, okay. Thing is that grain boundaries take up very little volume of the whole space. Okay. So yes, when it when it is a perfect crystal, the density will be maximal. You have to go to slightly lesser density in order to accommodate the boundary. But in thermodynamic limit, the amount of boundary. Divided by the amount of bulk, basically goes to zero. So the density is practically unchanged. So they are not typically low density, um, but they are different from, for example, interstitial defects and so on. But they have long distance effect. Okay. So coming back, so this is the velocity profile. How these particles move on the, near the two boundaries? They move very fast. Which I cannot accommodate in the scale. If I show them, then it will all the other arrows will be very very small. Okay, so what is interesting here? You can see that the solid particles are moving, and there are lots of so there are some cross movements. That is, it is moving from up to down or down to up. Basically, there is a grain boundary here. So particles are sliding. So there is a grain here. There is a grain there, and at the boundary they are sliding. Okay, so I am showing you this just to tell you that. the grains are still there for example here um, so sorry there is a clarification from professor, from professor singh he is asking that we meant uh, dislocation in perfect crystal sorry can you say it again so he says that he me main one talks of dislocation in perfect crystal dislocations in crystal nice perfect crystal dislocations in perfect crystal this the yeah, perfect crystals don't have dislocations yeah he meant in that uh, respect that is it not right that dislocation refer to low density defects in rather extended periodic system so when he mentioned this dislocation he uh, tried prefer i mean he mentioned means refer to dislocation as a, as it is in perfect crystal yes of course dislocation is a property of imperfect crystal but what i'm saying is that density doesn't have to be uh, macroscopically small in order to accommodate defects okay again okay, we we continue and then uh, at the end of the talk we ask processing to enter the room yeah. and okay. we can continue yeah. we'll, this discussion we'll come yeah. back to this yeah okay um okay so uh, what you are seeing is that there are a lot of cross movements happening and uh, actually yeah now coming back um, now trying to quantify that slightly more you see that these red circle regions if you see closely there are atoms which are moving uh, towards each other meaning okay so let's see uh, let's say at at here you see that these two big arrows they are moving out from this region and in the middle the arrows they are actually pointing towards each other so basically this is a hot spot okay similarly here similarly all these red regions on the other hand the ones which are here away they are actually grains meaning if i could make this thing look little bigger for you sorry 
yeah if i could make make it a little bigger for you you would see that these arrows there is a sense of rotation here so there is a grain here which is actually rotating okay and there are some hot spots and so my one of our objective was to find out why this hot spot happen okay and uh, so i will directly go to that there are of course characterization of this thing i can crudely just tell you the type of motion that is happening here as opposed to a straight line so this if you see this inset this is what is happening that is near the walls there is some motion to the left and to the right and in the middle it is hardly moving actually it is not at rest if you if you really uh, look at the velocity scale you will see that there there are velocities here although it is appearing to be almost not moving okay all these arrows are coming from the middle and they are moving very small amount compared to the bound close to the boundary uh, so the nature of movement is quite different from liquids that is near the boundary is lot of motion and in the middle very small motion i will not go into further characterization but i will jump to why these hot spots appear here okay okay so now again this is sort of characterization yeah so i i i just told you about these these are the hot spots seen in amorphous material okay now i i actually have a simulation but again i won't be able to show you that okay so here is the extraction from the simulation what you see are these atoms these circles are atoms and you see these pairs of uh, red and pink so they are defects so we call them 5 7 pairs meaning they have five neighbors or seven neighbors now during the motion now they are moving during the motion uh, inside this box this pair and this pair they are actually coming towards each other okay and you see the kind of velocity field it is generating so uh, see there are only particles here and i know their velocities these blue arrows are basically interpolation and if you look at the nature of these blue arrows you will see that uh, you see these two reds are coming towards each other and these pinks are going away and 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 if you look at the flow structure it is a saddle so here we understand where the hot spots are coming from okay and then we go to um, the physics of crystal defects so for example in a crystal for a aged dislocation so this sign is for dislocation this t sign um, so for such a defect one knows what should be the displacement field means a defect is a displacement field uh, atoms have moved here and there that's why this defect has one been one question from nitin uh, he is asking on the previous page is the velocity field specially averaged over various atoms or does one arrow correspond to one atom this one in the previous page yeah here maybe yeah so so this is average velocity um, okay. so 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 for example this is obtained by so you see this is the velocity versus along this lane so for this whole slice along x a slice uh, it is been averaged over the slice so that's why you see instead of a um, so this point actually represents the average velocity of a x a horizontal slice yes that's why it is showing zero almost zero but actually it is not zero we have 15 more minutes okay Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. So now, um, displacement fields for a defect is well known. Uh, so this was given by Frank in fifties. So if you take the displacement fields, which are analytic functions, into I mean which are well known functions, and ask that if I have a defect here at the origin, how will the displacement field look like? So that is this. And then if you put two defects side by side. each other they will have slight they you can see they are, they are oriented differently the superposition of these two defects gives you these red arrows which is hardly so this exactly matches with this qualitatively in the sense that two defects coming close to each other does produce this kind of saddle behavior so these so these hot spots that you see in the amorphous material they are reminiscent of 
these uh, defects of, of opposite signs coming to each other. But problem is that in amorphous material like this, you cannot define crystal. I mean, you, you cannot define local order. Hence, you cannot define a defect. So there is no concept of a defect, a dislocation in the context of amorphous material. But for a crystal, defect is a well-defined thing. So is for polycrystal. So what we are saying is that uh, these are essentially remnants of um, defects of opposite kind coming close to each other and giving this kind of structure. Okay, so it gives you some kind of rationalization of this defect of this saddle formation, not in amorphous material but in polycrystals. So what is new? Yeah, so this was not known before. That no no. So uh, sorry, the question was what is the new? So the the symbol new. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought any u. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, symbol. Sorry, which symbol? The new. So in the ux and the ui, in the ah, okay. is this x? Yeah, that one. Huh, okay, new is new is one of the crystal property. It is Poisson's ratio. Okay, and b is the Burgers vector. Sorry, I didn't explain this formula. Yeah. So let's continue. Yeah. Okay. So uh, again, this is a movie, and uh, yeah, it is showing. Can you see within this? Okay. Yes, it's showing. It's showing. Yeah, it's showing. I'll just, I'll just tell you. See what, what, what's happening. See this red and pink pair. This is a dislocation. There is another here. They're coming close to each other, and they will annihilate. And as they are annihilating, they are creating a flow structure, the so-called hotspot. See, this is gone, but you see, you see that there, you, you get this saddle kind of behavior. In, yeah, okay. So, move on. Another question from Professor Guru Ranjan. He is asking why are the two opposite type of dislocation do not cancel each other? Yeah, okay. I'm coming to that. Okay, I probably didn't mention it. Yeah, they are cancelling eventually. See, what you see here is that when they are far up, when they are slightly apart, they are distinct. But when they come close, see, they are coming close, and in the next step, they are annihilating each other. Okay, because they are oriented in the opposite direction, they are annihilating. On the other hand, I'll, I forgot to mention here the defects that you see lined up on the boundary. They have have actually the same orientation. So you, if you imagine them as T letter T's, so all the T's are aligned in the. I mean, all their heads are parallel. So all the T's, their heads are parallel here. On the other hand, the one here I showed you. You see, they are opposite. Okay. So dislocations when they are in the correct combination. They are stable, but if they are opposite, they will annihilate each other, and they will create this kind of flow structure. That is the point. Okay, so yeah, so now we'll come to the last part. But we have five minutes, yeah. So, yeah. Five minutes. Okay, fine. So this is the example of um, um, this is our recent paper. Um, so it is about a flow of polycrystal when you are driving them by some external force. It could be gravity, for example. So there are particles. Which is making this polycrystal, and you are driving them. All the particles are experiencing same same force. Imagine gravity. Okay, so in that case, uh, if it was a fluid, you would have gotten a parabolic profile. But here, what happens? Okay, so I'll just come to that directly. So this is our simulation of. Um, so this is actually MD simulation. MD simulation of this polycrystal, and you see grain structures. Um, there is a. I will show you a movie in which you will see that grains are forming and going, um, and new grains are coming in and so on. So there is an order parameter here, which is used, which is called a hexatic order parameter, which people use for um, hexatic phase, which comes in a in a solid to liquid transition. Um, but I won't go much into this. So for us, it is a um, it is a quantity. It's a, it's a scalar quantity. Which can tell you whether it's ordered or disordered. So, for example, the grain boundaries are disordered, and in, inside the grain they are ordered. So it can it can tell you where is the grain. Of course, it, it doesn't tell you the orientation of the grain. Okay. So um, now the flow dynamics. I will be able to flow. I think it will. 
yeah, you see how it is moving. So how the grains are breaking up and forming and so on. It's a short movie. It's not very. It doesn't look very continuous because I've taken snapshot at some intervals. Okay. So, but again, this does not tell you about the mean flow. It's not parabolic, but what it is. So here comes a bit of characterization. Uh, so you see grains here. That's not a big deal. But what you see here is that see there are these different grains demarcated by this dashed line. You see within the grains there are some velocities and they are not uniform. So inside the grains also there are small speeds. They are not all going together, and because of this difference in speed, this grain boundary will eventually uh, break and move somewhere. So these grains are not stable because of this inhomogeneity in their speed. They will actually break and form somewhere else. But we will directly jump to one particular feature. That is, uh, what happens if you if you make your channel very very narrow? So this is a phase diagram. So uh, roughly, if you put a lot of pressure, so this uh, y-axis is about um, how much force you are putting. It's a it's a it's a marker of that. So for example, what's it is called wall stress. It has this external force. W is the width and so on. And on the x-axis, you, you have width, channel width. So uh, what's happening is that if you apply less force, and if your width is also very small, then nothing moves. See, what's happening here is that you are pushing all the particles. But the wall is giving you some friction. So only if your force is sufficient enough so that it can work on the friction, it will move. Not otherwise. So this lower part, low force and low width, it is jammed. And the other part, high force and high width, they move. And this is the phase boundary, which tells you that higher the width, you need lower force to make them move. Okay. And uh, I'm showing here some kind of uh, schematic diagrams. How do the grain structure look? Um, but what we generally find is that for um, uh, large winds, you get a you get this green type of flow. That is, it is kind of uniform. Most of the part, it is a uniform. This is a, on the other hand, for very narrow channel, it is parabolic. But again, uh, parabolic is quite counterintuitive here. So I will directly jump to this parabolic flow. How do you get parabolic? So you do get parabolic flow when you have a very narrow channel, okay, and it happens quite dramatically. So I directly jump to that. So this is what happens in a narrow channel. So it's the same. We are using that same order parameter. The red ones are the ordered regions, and the other colors, lighter colors, they are disordered. So if you see these four diagrams, so these are very narrow channel, four snapshots, four su successive snapshots in time. Time is going upward. And so what you see is that, so in this case, your force is from left to right. So as a whole, the system, all the particles are actually moving to the right. Okay. Whereas you see that seeing these four pictures side by side, you can make out that this disordered region is going to the left. You see from here to there to there, whereas the, as a whole, the particles are actually moving to the right because there is a force to the right. Okay. And if you plot the density at different times, so this is called a chymograph. So at, at different times, you are plotting. So this whole channel you are rep representing as a one dimensional density profile, which comes here. What you see is that the low density region, which is the black, that is moving at a constant speed towards the right, sorry, towards the left. How does that happen? Now, if you analyze a little closely, you see that um, there are these um, red zones, which are actually crystalline, small crystallites, I would call. And there are these uh, zones, which are liquid-like. And in the liquid-like portion, for example, here, it is less dense. And in the solid-like portion, they are more dense. And in the liquid-like portion, they are moving like a parabola. 
whereas the solid like portions you see that they are hardly moving but then how is the whole thing moving to the right okay so what's happening is that imagine that you have this uh, solid liquid solid liquid type so you concentrate on this fluid zone and there is solid here now in the fluid zone their speeds are higher because there is lot of space it's the same force on everybody but there is lot of space so they move high speed so when they move high speed they will move but they will get stuck at the front which is a solid okay so this solid so this liquid uh, so so these particles are get, basically getting stuck there on the other hand on the left you have solid and particles are evaporating from the solid liquid junction i'm saying evaporating all that it means is they are coming out from the solid because there is a force and it's a boundary see inside the solid they are stable because there are particles all around they are keeping they are being kept together by this attraction of all the neighbors but at the boundary they are loose and you have a force so at the interface they are evaporating joining to the liquid and on the right front the liquid is joining to the solid so as a result this liquid front is moving to the left okay so that's what is happening here so there is a density low density profile which is moving to the left and the high density which is continuing to the right so that's the origin of this wave we call it a kinematic density wave so apparently uh, so you can characterize it in in a more better fashion and so on um, now this has been seen experimentally this has been seen in traffic flows also imagine a lane in which lots of traffic are flowing multi lane traffic so in such uh, i mean in traffic flows such kind of backward moving density waves has been seen so this is an experiment or an old experiment they also saw the same thing that when uh, they um, when the channel width was large it was moving like so this is a flow profile velocity on this axis and the width on this axis so the red thing is a plug flow that is everybody moving at constant speed and the green one is a parabolic flow which is happening at the narrow channels and i forgot to mention one thing if you try to calculate what is the average flow profile as a function of width okay what will happen is that these zones will dominate this parabolic zones parabolic flow profile they are high and they will dominate on the other hand this solid regions will give you almost nothing so that's why the overall profile looks parabolic but if you look into it specially you find this difference so the point here is this this low density wave has been seen in experiment also uh, so this is a colloidal system and uh, one last thing i wanted to mention was that at intermediate width what happens is that there are incursions that happens from the boundary which breaks up this solid into uh, solid liquids liquid parts in the sense that see when you have large width everything is red inside and only near the boundary it is yellow that is the liquid as the width goes down there are incursions from the boundary like this and it breaks up the system into solid liquid solid liquid transverse layers okay so okay so we we had done a um, stability analysis and found uh, so this is a very um, 1d approximate theory and you can show there are such kinematic waves are possible um it was shown some things that were shown in a yeah i am almost talking yeah. in a, some other some other theory paper on the simulation paper although there is some difference we have with them so essentially i'll stop here so the conclusions are um, that these are this polycrystalline flows are somewhat special and and um, you do see some defect structures giving rise to saddle and uh, the, the other aspect i talked about in pressure driven flow is that you see a upward backward moving density um, of liquids which comes out from the simulation so uh, so i'd like to stop here okay thank you anivanda
I clap for the others, and I will ask other people to join now the room so that uh, you can have a discussion with them. Yeah. So let's wait for a few more uh, minutes, sure. and now uh, that other will join the room. Anything, please go ahead. Ask a question. Okay, so uh, I had this question. Um, so, uh, like you showed uh, for liquids uh, at low Reynolds number, when the flow is. Uh, okay, am I audible? Yes, yes you are audible. Very good. So there is a there is a there is a delay. To switch off your YouTube. YouTube. All right, all right. I'll do it. Sorry. I can hear you clear. Okay, so. Uh, so let me ask it very briefly. So can you uh, like uh, define some kind of Reynolds number for the, such like granular or colloidal systems? Although we are like talking about, like you showed that in certain uh, approximation, you see oh, parabolic yeah. flow, which yeah. might correspond to low yeah. Reynolds yeah. number yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of right. uh, phase. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like, can we define a Reynolds number in like these granular systems? In, in these colloidal systems. I mean, one problem is yes. I mean, if you use the average flow ve velocity, then you can, of course, in the same way. But the the the, the, the problem is that here the average profiles are uh, showing you parabolic or a plug like like profile. But in the case of actual liquid, it is the uniform. I mean, the flow is uniform. Uh, like can we define the Reynolds number in like these granular systems? So it's colloidal. System. I mean, one problem is yes. I mean, if you use the average flow velocity, then you can. But but but, but 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 one big problem here is that you do not know what is viscosity. Here, okay. So here, for example, in these cases, um, the simple viscosity formula that stress is equal to stress is viscosity into del. I mean, gradient of velocity that does not work. So you cannot define viscosity in that way. So for Reynolds number, you still need a viscosity. So that way, it's a problem. OK, so there is another person in the room. So please, can you please ask a question after you unmute yourself? I think. I don't know. Somebody is there, but. Uh, you can't. Yeah. yeah, I saw that Dibendu Dash was there, but I cannot. I think he cannot unmute you himself. I can't unmute him either. So there's none. So, but there is a question by Professor Singh. I let me just iterate. So he was asking, how do we define the measure of narrowness of channel in terms of system parameters? OK. So for, for example, in this particular case, so let us just look at this experimental graph. So here, uh, you see there is a 2A. So A is the width, width of the channel, and B is the diameter of particle. So what they are showing here is that as you make that as the channel width is 20 times the diameter, you start to see these oscillations. But when the channel width is 40 times of the diameter, you don't see these oscillations. So there is a, some characteristic length scale. Characteristic. So narrow means really narrow in terms of molecular scales. So right. this, these are so 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 one I forgot, forgot to mention because see this these experiments are only possible with colloidal fluids, not with atomic fluids. The reason is that the for colloidal fluids, the length scales are in microns. And so you can uh, have channels. Micron, sorry, nanometer, hundreds of nanometers, or even micron sometimes. So in these sort of experiments, your channels are a couple of mi microns thick, I mean wide, and your particles are, let's say, um, sub-micron. So you can reach a limit wh when the channel width is only, let's say, 20 times or 10 times the molecular diameter, which is impossible for atomic scales. So, so all that you wanted to know about the atomic scale solid, they are being tested these days in the context of colloidal fields. 
there was one more question uh, by Sumir on previously. I uh, I did not disrupt you in between. So that was about uh, whether the I think dislocation are coming close by by accident or there are some attraction to it. So he was asking a question like that. Uh, yeah, see, this somewhat, uh, the flow is somewhat random here. So uh, dislocations, uh, no, I, I don't know the answer actually, because um, I don't know how to study the dislocation dynamics in this case, because um, the force is coming from the boundary mm -hmm. and uh, the dislocations are mostly at the grain boundaries. So depending on how the grains are moving or breaking or reforming the dislocations behave likewise so i so, i mean it is not that i can put some dislocations and then give some interaction among them of course there are these mesoscopic modeling which people do in metallurgy where there are these um, models of dislocations and uh, interacting with some effective potentials and there um, so i do not know how they model it, meaning what kind of potential they put in, is it attraction, repulsion, or what kind of it? Is it just a two body or is it more than that? Is it tensorial? I don't know. But there are uh, there are um, some kind of effective interaction between them mediated via these brains and so on. Okay, so there is somebody in the Jitsi room. Please ask your question. If you can hear me. Yeah, ask your question, please, if, if you can hear me. No, seems nobody is nobody seems to be asking the question. Yeah, okay. So then in that case, I think we should end the okay. uh, talk. I would like to thank you again, Anirvanda, for coming Sorry and giving a talk. My fault, yeah. actually. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Thank you very much. And we will meet next week again uh, for... Bye. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.